Hello everyone. So this is GS Mains Paper Three, September two thousand seventeen, Part One. Okay. So the first topic for today is there were certain news which I have written in my copy and I I, I think I noted it down actually. So I thought I will discuss it with you. So these are I think more important from prelims point of view as compared to mains point of view. But since I have uh, what do you say? Written it down, so I thought I will share it with you. See, Buxa or Buxa, whatever it is named, it is named or it is called. So, Buxa Tiger Reserve was in news, right? So, first of all, we have to understand where is it. It is in West Bengal. Remember, when you will look at the map, you will realize that it is much closer to Bhutan, but it is in West Bengal. So, Buxa Tiger Reserve was in news, and it is in West Bengal. Now, second fact, plastic waste. So, that is again this particular thing you can use it in your mains. So, what is what what is the news regarding plastic waste? So the fact is, 60 cities across India generate over 15,000 tons of plastic waste every day. How many? 15,000 tons of plastic waste every day, right? And almost 6 million tons per year. Now, what is happening because of these plastic waste? So ruminants like cow and buffalo unknowingly devour plastic material and end up dying a slow and painful death. It doesn't affect us. We don't eat it. But these cow and buffalo, they are not intelligent like us, right? So they end up eating it, and then they die a slow and painful waste. So please stop using plastic, not for our sake. If we are not, we cannot stop for our sake. Stop for these people or these animals' sake, right? Because they are dying. Okay, it sounded funny, but still fine. So the thing is, let's move on to the next and some real news. So this was just a small tidbit, but I wanted to share it with you people. Now the second thing, which is very important, and it's, it's a very important news. We all know that the growth rate has decreased and it has gone up to like 5.7 percent, and government is facing severe criticism for it, right? So the main news is whether 8 percent growth rate is still possible. And the fact is, when I will discuss with this particular article, you will realize that everything structure means lots and lots of things are favorable for us. Monsoon was normal this time, inflation is moderate, all these things are fine. Still, our growth rate reduced. So that means there were certain what do you say? Uh, policy implementation failure, which led to decrease in growth rate, right? Fine. So an immediate stimulus needed to regain momentum to get India back to 8% growth. Now the thing is, inflation is moderate, 1.5%. Trade and fiscal deficit is also moderate and manageable. Monsoon is also normal. Despite these favorable macro factors, we have not managed to convert them into a higher growth rate, right? Now we'll talk about something very unique, and that will again clear the concept of nominal GDP and real GDP. The thing is, agriculture sector GDP shows nominal GDP growth rate to be lower than real GDP, which is very unusual. See, if your nominal GDP becomes lesser than real GDP, what does it mean? See, what is first of all nominal GDP and real GDP? See, the thing is, if if you would say in nominal GDP takes into account, uh, what do you say in real GDP? It takes into account inflation factor also, but in nominal GDP, we just take it as it is. First of all, for understanding, we have to understand a formula or funda called base rate. So let's take an example to understand this nominal and real GDP. So let's take a base a base year of suppose 2000. Fine. And so uh, this year is 2017. So now suppose in this 2017 we produce 1000 goods and services. So 1000 into if we do 1000 into uh, the price which was there in 2000, then we will get the real GDP. But if we do Thousand into whatever price we are incurring right now, then that it, it will give us nominal GDP. So obvious common sense will tell you that in this year, in 2017, our not nominal GDP will be greater than real GDP because price must have inflated. But what is happening in agriculture side sector GDP? The nominal GDP growth rate is lower than real GDP, right? Which means farmers' incomes are depressed, and doubling farmers' income will become a much more distant dream, right? Now, how we can achieve 8% growth rate? So the big structural reforms of GST, the new insolvency code, the new monetary framework, and the Aadhaar linkage are measures which will show result in the medium to long term. So you can say that big structural reforms are going on. So that's why the growth rate has reduced. But the problem is growth rate has reduced to a means it has reduced significantly, and that is creating a lot and lots of problem, right? It, MSME is is affected a lot, and we'll talk about more. We'll talk more about that particular thing. But it is it has become very sentimental issue also. Apart from an economic one, right? So let's move move on to the next topic: natural capital. See, the, see the thing is, what is natural capital? Forest is an example of natural capital, and it is topic twelve in government, right? So if valued properly, natural capital can maximize the benefits of economic growth and development. Now, what does Buddha says about natural capital or forest? So Buddha has said that forest is a peculiar organism. He has compared it to an organism. 
he has stayed most of his life in forest right so for him it was equivalent to an organism so forest is a peculiar organism of unlimited kindness it offers protection to all beings offering shed even to x men who destroys it unquote so this was a statement of buddha right fine so buddha said again i will say so buddha said quote forest is a peculiar organism of unlimited kindness and it offers protection to all beings offering shed even to x men who destroys it unquote so that is the whole statement of buddha fine now see the thing is forest has both tangible and intangible value we will understand what is tangible and what is intangible but first of all let's see some facts so india has 11% of world's floral and faunal species and india is one of the 17 most ecologically diverse countries the financial value of india's forest which encompass economic services such as timber and fuel wood and ecological services such as carbon sequestration estimated to be 1.7 trillion dollars so the thing is i have talked about carbon sequestration and geo engineering in one of the previous videos do refer to it fine now the thing is unlike the economic value of goods and services intangible nature of natural assets is mostly invisible and hence remain unaccounted for so intangible tangible means which can be touched intangible means which cannot be touched so forests give us lots of tangible benefits which you can see but it also gives lots of intangible benefits like it controls climate change and all those things so it has a great value and we should preserve it that is what this particular article is aiming for fine now let's move on to two of the most important topics very 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 important so this first is advanced pricing agreement and beps beps is base erosion and profit shifting so this you can put in topic 1 also in any economy and issues and you can put it in topic 3 also that is budgeting now first of all we will understand what is apa what is advanced pricing agreement and what is beps fine and what is happening what is the relationship between apa and beps and why we are reading this particular article and why we are reading this particular thing So first of all, APA is an agreement, and again we'll also talk about arms length price. So APA is an agreement between a taxpayer, example MNCs, multinational companies, and tax authorities, which validates transfer pricing between two interrelated companies and ensures that it is equivalent to an arms length length price. So suppose Vodafone India uh, wants to buy something from. suppose vodafone has an intermediary company or so let's take an example of vodafone india only so vodafone india wants to buy something from vodafone netherland right so in that case it has to take a what is the permission right that that particular whole thing which they are doing the whole trans means buying from a particular interrelated company has to be validated by a tax authority so that validation is called apa that whole agreement is called apa and in that case you have they have to also ensure that it is equal to an arms length price now what is arms length price so the thing is keeping transfer pricing at arms length implies that price will be the one at which two unrelated parties will make a deal based on market forces of demand and supply and not to avoid taxes so that means if netherland india as sorry ford of india is uh, doing certain uh, what do you say transactions or certain uh, deal with uh what of netherland so in that case this whole thing will be guided by the market forces of demand and supply and it, it, it will not be like they are doing this particular agreement to avoid taxes so this whole thing is called arms length keeping transfer pricing at arms length so whole this thing will be done based on the uh, what is a market forces of demand and supply now apa is a win win situation for both tax authorities and companies as tax tax authorities get their legitimate dues because this whole thing has been legitimized so they will be knowing so getting their dues getting their taxes fine and companies become immune to future litigation so companies also feel that yeah we'll pay the taxes because in future we won't have to fight the only thing we don't won't have to fight too many court cases now let's talk about the relationship between apa and bps fine now the thing is first of all let's understand what is bps so firms make profit in one jurisdiction and shift their uh, what do you say shift them across borders by exploiting gaps in tax rules to take advantage of lower tax rate and thus not paying taxes to in the country where the profit is made right so suppose there are certain companies which work in india and after that what do they do they uh, what do you say transfer this whole thing they transfer their whole uh, transaction to another country and in that country if that country is a tax haven so the tax rate will be very low and they won't be paying any tax example is flipkart we we'll talk about flipkart so again what is vps uh, i will reiterate it so firms make profit in one jurisdiction and shift them across borders by exploiting gaps in tax rules to take advantage of lower tax rates and thus not paying taxes to in the country where the profit is made this whole thing is vps base erosion and profit shifting now what are the companies which are using vps flipkart is using it so they are earning profits in india but they are incorporating in tax havens like singapore etc right and remember tax haven it is not h a v e n this is h a v e n haven fine fine 
and again vodafone vodafone is another example so they use transfer pricing to avoid tax on uh, sale of assets or shares now i will tell you i will give you a data very important data so the thing is because of this reason only the major three fdi destinations from which means from where ma maximum fdi or maximum investment comes to india are surprisingly mauritius singapore and uk so uk is fine but mauritius and singapore can you imagine these are tiny tiny little island in fact singapore is a nation state a city state and Mauritius is an island, right? But from there, maximum FDI is coming, maximum investment is coming. Why? Because they are tax haven, right? So all these things are going on, right? Now the thing is, what is why? What is the relationship between AP and BPS? So a AP is a component, or it is one of the component to curb this BPS, base erosion and profit shifting, and it will help in long run by bringing uniformity, transparency, and avoid tussle with tax authorities. Now let's move on to the second most important topic of this particular video, that is PPP in infrastructure financing. So this is a topic of this is a topic of or what is it? This is a sub topic of topic nine infrastructure, right? Now let's talk about what are the flaws, what are the issues in PPP. What is PPP? Public private partnership. So what are the flaws in PPP in infrastructure financing? So first issue is risk management. Nobody is ready to take the risk, right? They will build a bridge, but if that particular bridge falls, they will not take the responsibility. So risk management involves inefficient and inequitable allocation of risk. Contracts focused more on revenue generation rather than efficient delivery of services. So that is the first issue, right? risk management. Second is governance and institutional capacity. What does it mean? There is no ex ante structure for renegotiation. Failed projects lead neither to penalties nor investigation. So you have a particular contract, but if that product contract fails there's no case of penalty or investigation right oops or sometimes even over regulation and multiple clearances retard the process starting from bidding to execution stage so this is the second issue is governance and inst institutional capacity third issue is related to project development what happens project development activities such as detailed feasibility study environmental clearances etc are not given adequate importance by developers and authorities so these are the main issues or main flaws right first flaw let's summarize it first flaw is Nobody, uh, what do you say? Inequitable all allocation of risk. Nobody knows who is from whom you will be fixing the accountability of a particular failure, right? Second issue is there are too much regulations, right? And there are multiple clearances, plus there is no provision of penalties and investigation, right? Third issue is that we don't these these in project development activities like feasibility study, environmental clearances, these are not given adequate importance, right? Fine. Now, what is the way forward? How can we reinvigorate? PPP model, right? So the thing is very important, very, very important. See, PCA Act, when I was making videos for second ERC, ethics and governance, I've talked extensively about PCA, right? Prevention on Corruption Act 1988, because this report four of ARC, second ARC, ethics and governance is talking extensively about prevention of corruption act 1988 they have talked about pc 1947 also they have also talked about what are the other anti corruption laws so do watch those videos because that will make things much more clearer so what is the way to re reinvigorate ppp model first thing is this pc act 1988 should be amended to distinguish between genuine errors in decision making and act of corruption by public servants so because of this pc they act as a deterrent even then why deterrent because sometimes even if they want to take some genuine decision they're not able to take it because they feel like they will be penalized for it if does it if that particular decision doesn't work out so that is the thing so pca should be amended to distinguish between genuine errors in decision making and act of corruption by public servants second thing is we need to set up an independent regulator or tribunal for quick and efficient dispute resolution it should not go to court because they are already suffering from the means what is it humongous pendency of cases right so it should go to an independent regulator or tribunal Third uh, way, way is we need to assign construction and maintenance responsibility to a single entity. Whoever is constructing a bridge, that particular entity will be managed, managed, responsible for maintaining it also. Because in that case, what happens? They just construct bridge in one or two years. They don't care how they are making it. And after that, if something happens to it, maintenance department or maintenance thing is done by someone else. So that is the whole issue. Accountability is not getting fixed. So we need to assign a construction and maintenance responsibility to a single entity. Fine. Now let's talk about the last topic for today that is Anthropocene. We have talked about it means we always talk about Holocene, Pleistocene. So again, this new term has come into existence which is Anthropocene. What is Anthropocene? And this period means starts from where and ends where, right? So this is a period when human activities begin to have a significant impact on the state of trans ecology, right? And it's believed to have begun during the latter part of 18th century when Scottish inventor James Watt invented the steam engine. Because after that, 
pollution started on a significant means level and that started affecting other organisms also so that is anthropocene period started during the latter part of 18th century so this is it remember gs3 has lots and lots of good articles and i have also I mean summarize some other articles from different sources so we'll be covering it and yeah it will be a long session but yeah all these topics will be very very handy for you if you're making notes if you're read means listening it again and again it will be very 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 helpful for you that's a promise from my side okay fine thank you